Do you think culture should be described or prescribed? That feisty debate is the topic of today's video. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So every community has a culture, but how do we know what that culture is? Who gets to decide what is part of Irish culture, or Tokyo culture, or LGBT culture, or gamer culture, and what isn't? So today, we are going to talk about two theories of how to answer this question. Descriptivism and prescriptivism. Generally speaking, being a prescriptivist means having a strong sense of how a culture should be. That is to say, a prescriptivist description of what sort of stuff does or doesn't belong in a particular culture. A sense of a culture defined by clear rules of correct and incorrect. Today we sometimes refer to this sort of attitude with the pejorative term gatekeeping, but it's a fair metaphor in the sense it's possible to think of a culture as something that must be confined and protected with a guard at the door who knows what to let in and what to keep out. To be a descriptivist, meanwhile, is to be more interested in defining a culture based around your observation of what is currently being done. That is to say, you simply describe what you see happening in the cultural community and draw your conclusions about the culture from that, even if what you see contradicts what the gatekeepers say is important or correct. Another metaphor for these two camps could be the idea of a teacher versus a documentary filmmaker. One is more interested in telling you what should be done, the other merely tells you what is being done. So. Do you have an instinctive sense of which camp you're in? Let me now give you some tangible examples of how these ideas play out in the real world. So the cultural realm where the descriptivist versus prescriptivist divide is most famously applied is in language. When we identify a particular language as being associated with a particular culture, we can either describe the character of that language by noticing the sort of vocabulary and grammar and pronunciations we hear and read ordinary people writing and saying in their day-to-day -day lives, or we can turn to some set of prescriptive rules that seek to tell us what is the objectively right or wrong way to speak and write the language. In France, for instance, they have the Académie of Français, which is a very prescriptivist sort of organization. It is literally a council of 40 men and women considered experts in the French language, academics and writers and so forth, and they sit in a big chamber in a grand palace wearing fancy uniforms and decree to the world the rules of proper French. Sometimes their decrees are very technical, like when they declared in 2020 that the noun COVID should be used with the feminine definite article, and sometimes they just completely invent brand new words or phrases that the French language doesn't have yet, like when they came up with the term hyper accéléré to describe that kind of really sped up video where you see something really slow happen really quickly, what we would call a time lapse. Now this sort of top-down rulemaking doesn't always catch on, and French people can and do use all sorts of terms that the Académie Française hasn't officially endorsed. But the ongoing survival of the Académie Française as an institution, which was established by the French government almost 400 years ago, does nevertheless signal a certain desire to at least attempt to keep this aspect of French culture officially prescribed. Way on the other end, you would have the vastly more descriptivist approach to language that governs English in the United States and Great Britain. The closest English equivalent to the Académie Française would be the two big English language dictionaries, the Merriam-Webster and Oxford. But these are put out by private companies that make a big show of constantly updating them to include every possible new word or expression or slang term or even spelling that ordinary Americans or Brits are using at any given time regardless of how weird. So for example, in 2019, the Oxford English Dictionary added whatevs to its pages, while in 2021, Merriam-Webster added, am I right? These two publications also routinely update their existing words with whatever new definitions they notice people are coming up with. In 2018, for instance, Oxford added person who is easily offended to their definition of snowflake, while in 2019, Merriam-Webster updated their definition of they to include the personal pronoun of a non-binary person. Now the fact
fact that the descriptivists run the English language dictionaries is controversial to some degree. Certainly anyone who has taken a high school English course will know that there are still plenty of people in the English-speaking world who take the idea of correct English very seriously. And they would argue that no, literally, does not mean intensely, even though that has become a fairly mainstream and dictionary acknowledged usage. But I would say that the idea of English as existing in a much more descriptivist language culture than a language like French is generally seen as a mostly positive attribute of our culture overall, just as I'm sure the French think in a mostly broadly positive way about their more prescriptive language culture, even if neither community is 100% loyal to either principle in practice. All right, so here is another example of something that fans of this channel in particular might appreciate. Flags. So flag culture is generally very prescriptivist in the sense that in most places there is usually a pretty strictly defined right and wrong way to make a flag. If you were to be like, hey, check it out, I made my own Italian flag, people would regard you as kind of nuts or even offensive just because we have largely accepted the principle that designing a community flag is something that a government or some other elite institution does for us. Flags are also very prescriptivist in the sense that there are a lot of big shot flag experts or flag spurts out there who have written up all of these grand principles regarding how a flag is supposed to look. And most flag designers are in the world play along with these rules. You know, rules dictating things like how a flag should only have a limited number of colors and use mostly simple geometric shapes and never have words and so on. Now, if you are something of a flag spurt yourself, you are likely familiar with the fact that many flags of the cities and states in the US do not obey these rules. Indeed, American state and city flags often feature very detailed designs with lots of color and text, which causes some prescriptivist types within the flag community to react with horror and outrage. What a flag culture descriptivist would say, however, is that these flags are fine. They simply embody America's unique flag culture. Culture. Americans, for whatever reason, like making flags with detailed designs and lots of text, with the much maligned seal on a bedsheet style design actually being a very common and thus very important American cultural symbol. I mean, who died and made the North American Vexillological Association king of flag rules? The descriptivist would say that a good American flag is simply a flag that Americans have accepted and embraced and they shouldn't feel pressure to abandon this part of their culture just to appease the haughty hang-ups of some elite. The movement to change American state and city flags can thus be understood as a primarily culturally prescriptivist movement, one that seeks to change these cultural objects to conform to a fixed cultural standard. But you can also say that the fact that these movements haven't received much pushback shows how weak America's descriptivist flag culture is as well. Now, the degree that some Americans in the South didn't want to abandon the Confederate flag is an interesting case study because you could say that that cause had some strong elements of descriptivism to it. Obviously, the Confederate flag is a symbol of a discredited racist regime, and obviously the politics of this reality is why it ultimately had to go. But for a long time, there were a lot of Southerners who made what were effectively descriptivist arguments in its favor, saying that independent of the flag's original history, the Confederate flag had undeniably hung around for a long time, and in doing so, gradually became just a generic part of Southern culture, simply because it was so commonly seen and used. It had just become a symbol of the South that survived in part because at least some significant proportion of Southerners just passively accepted its presence. Which is interesting because it shows that the descriptive versus prescriptive frame doesn't always track neatly onto a standard dichotomy of right versus left or progressive versus conservative. Sometimes descriptivists can be seen as the more progressive and democratic side of a cultural argument because they are often framed as being on the side of the people, while the prescriptivists are on the side of a small and bossy elite at the top of society. But descriptivists can also become very conservative when they are overly defensive about the way things are. That can be a logic that's hostile to productive change and growth in a culture, and one that defends all sorts of crude or awful traditions simply because that's just what's done. Okay, so here's another good example of all of this. Fashion. The other day, I was reading this interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal 
describing what they referred to as the fashion food chain. And it really came off as a very top-down, very prescriptive approach to building this important part of global culture. At the top of the hierarchy are the super high-end fashion designers who are basically trusted to set the world's trends. They are very creative and artistic people, and they dream up really imaginative but utterly impractical outfits that are shown a couple of times a year at fancy fashion shows in places like Milan and New York and Paris. And the people who work at commercial clothing companies attend these shows, and then they go back home and incorporate some of the ideas that they saw, like colors or necklines or whatever, into the much less ambitious outfits that they design and sell at stores in the mall. And then you have the even lower tier designers who make the clothes sold at Target or places like that, who take their inspiration from the higher end commercial fashion designers, who are taking their inspiration from the highest end fashion designers. So that's the prescriptive half of the story where fashion comes from, especially women's fashion, which is usually very sensitive to changing trends. But the other half of the story is very interesting because it is almost equally descriptive. You see, for every person the clothing companies pay to ponder the runway trends, they will pay someone else to fly to cities that are particularly known for having having cool people like Tokyo and New York, and they will just observe what the people there are currently wearing, especially the teenagers, because everybody wants to dress like a cool young person. If you think of a fashion designer like Jerry Lorenzo, who is probably one of the more influential figures in global men's fashion over the last decade, the styles he is credited with popularizing are openly based on a certain kind of standard urban teenager look, rather than anything super creative or new. I mean, the name for this kind of look, Streetwear really says it all. The look of the streets, the look of the people, pure descriptivism. Both the descriptive and prescriptive aspects of fashion do ultimately have to operate within the confines of the market economy, however. Which is to say, as much as your average middle-class shopper might want to follow the runway trends or dress like the cool teens of Tokyo, they also tend to be quite cautious and moderate and don't necessarily want to wear anything that's either too highbrow or too lowbrow, which makes consumerism a sort of moderating force on both the descriptivist and prescriptivist impulses of the fashion industry. You could say that middle-class consumerism moderates the character of a lot of cultural products, in fact, preventing things like food, music, and movies from getting too bound to overly trendy elite tastes on the one hand, or to static and status quo on the other. Okay, now let's talk about how these principles can play out in the context of the culture of a whole country. Specifically, let us take a look at my country, Canada. The Canadian government has always had a lot of anxiety about the fact that this country is very similar to the United States. So in 1949, the Canadian government put together a committee run by a big shot named Vincent Massey to ponder the state of Canadian culture. And in 1951, the Massey Commission released a famous report saying that unless the Canadian government started taking a more active role in regulating and financing stuff like Canadian movies and musicians and TV shows, the distinct identity of this country would get completely subsumed into the United States. And this has basically been the conventional wisdom of the Canadian government ever since, with Ottawa introducing all sorts of regulations and rules and subsidies over the last 70 years to build and sustain an independent, un-American Canadian cultural identity. It's been manifest in everything from the federal government providing funding to distinctly Canadian sitcoms or operas to Justin Trudeau's controversial efforts to force YouTube to push more Canadian content videos on Canadian users. Now this is all very prescriptive. The Massey Report noted that Canada was awash in American movies and TV shows and books and the rest, but this was seen as a problem to be solved as opposed to just a neutral characteristic of what Canada was like. Government support for better, distinctly Canadian cultural products was almost understood as a kind of prescription drug that the Canadian people needed to take in order to make themselves stronger as a nation. The problem with the prescriptive approach to fixing this purported problem, however, has always been 
that government-backed cultural content has often been resented by the very public it's supposed to be helping. In the old days, for instance, critics complained that a lot of the supposedly good Canadian cultural content that Ottawa was pushing just reflected the tastes of old, rich, white guys like Vincent Massey, and excluded content made by, say, women or people of color who weren't considered good enough by the people at the top. And of course, these days, a lot of people get upset at a government that they think has gone too far in the other direction, you know, blowing tax dollars on content that is too politically correct or woke or whatever. In some ways, the issue is a bit like what we just talked about with fashion, except in this case, instead of having consumerism acting as a check on the elitist nature of prescriptivism, we've got the principle of democracy. Democracy says that the public should ultimately determine the priorities of the government, but this often leads to tension with a government that may believe the public is not a good judge of the sort of cultural content that they actually need. Personally, I am a descriptivist when it comes to Canadian culture, in that I regard the American nature of Canadian society as more of a fact than a problem. I even think that Canadian anti-Americanism is basically a kind of self-loathing, since it encourages Canadians to feel insecure and ashamed of having very mainstream Canadian tastes. But you know, on the other hand, you could also say that all countries are inescapably prescriptivist projects on some level. All nations expect their rulers to engage in at least some form of cultural gatekeeping, often with a literal gate to keep the wrong sort of cultural influences out. Otherwise, we're not going to have our country anymore. As one famous American statesman once put it. So anyway, hopefully this video has given you some new ways to think about how to define culture. I know I've been presenting the prescriptivist descriptivist divide as a bit of an either or binary, even though of course most people would say that both principles are useful in certain contexts. When we argue about the application of these principles, whether it is in the context of making a dictionary or a flag or deciding who the government should give an arts grant to, we are usually arguing more about getting the prescriptive descriptive balance right, as opposed to just going completely all in in one theory or the other. In the comments below, I would be curious to hear if you guys can think of any other realms of culture that tend to be strongly defined by prescriptive descriptive tensions. Let me know your thoughts on all of this, and I will see you next week.